Good morning. We're happy to be here. This uh, church here. I'm, oh, I'm Joe Lindemann with Firefighters for Christ. I'm president of Firefighters for Christ, and uh, just happy to be here. This is this is like our church family. We we've been here before, and you've lo loaned us your pastor many times to go on trips with us, and we appreciate that. And we're uh, glad to have him. He's he's our official ch uh, pastor for Firefighters for Christ International. So before I forget, we have some stuff back there on the table. We have these, uh, and they're all for free. These are some uh, bracelets said in honor of the memory of the uh, my FND brothers, 9-11-01 is when. And that's why we're here today. We're, we're going to kind of memorialize what took place on 9-11. We have a, Jerry Silcox going to come up and speak. And he's going to give a testimony of what took place back there the day that he was back there. And then we're going to get the, his wife, Diane's perspective of what took place. Many times we don't hear from the wives. And, uh, you know, they're kind of always in the background and stuff. But there was a lot of things going on, as you can imagine, uh, with the different, uh, you know, all the deaths that took place. 343 firefighters lost their lives. Jerry knew many of them. And he has some, uh, some stories that he'll share with you. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just something that then Phil's going to follow up with a gospel message. And if you don't know Jesus, you're going to know him by the end of the, uh, by the end of these guys are done talking. Come on up, Jerry. And uh, so Jerry's from, of course, New York Fire Department. And Phil is from Northern Ireland Fire Department. And I've had the pleasure of having these guys stay with me. And they, had, they have a lot of stories to tell you. But, uh, you know, nothing can top what Bob just told us about being a bull, uh, bullfighter. That's pretty cool. You know, that is cool. cool. So I'm sure you Thanks, might want to try that out now. See, no. I'm going I'm to put some horns on you when we get home. And I just got cataract surgery, Jill. I can't do bullfighting. <laughs> anyway, one thing I can tell you about both these men that are speaking here today, they're, they're men of God. They, they are uh, sold out, and they'll do wherever they can go and anything they can do in order to bring the gospel message to those who haven't heard it. And those who have heard it, they're, they're sharing it so they can encourage them to get on the right path in what God has for you. A lot of times, you know, we, we say, okay, I'm good. I've accepted Jesus. And then where do they go? They, that's it. They're, they're in. They're going to live their lives the way they want to live it. And they're not living it for Jesus. And these men, I know for sure, are living it for Jesus because they'll go anywhere, anytime, anywhere in the world, and they share the gospel message. They're, and they're, uh, God is using them in a great way. So don't Thank get you, a big Joe. head about it either, Jerry. Thank you, Joe. All right. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. I just want to acknowledge a couple people first. Um, there actually is a firefighter who actually we worked together. We didn't know each other. And uh, Brogan, could you just stand up and be acknowledged? That's great. Uh, Brogan was a New York City fireman while I was. So. <laughs> Thanks. Anyway. Um, I want to acknowledge a few people. So in this audience of Firefighters for Christ, I'm going to ask some people to stand up who came to New York to help our chapter of Firefighters for Christ in the FDNY during 9-11. And just wait till you see how many people are going to stand up. So everybody who came out that first year, year and a half, wives, everybody, stand up so they could see you that came out to New York to help out. These are the guys that actually, and their wives, who came out to help when we needed help during 9-11. So you have a connection here in California. Firefighters for Christ, we're a group that supports each other all over the world. We actually have some German friends here today. It's amazing how the gospel of Jesus Christ brings us together. So um, I would like to acknowledge our firefighters that are here today, our police officers, and our military, as it's Patriots Day, I agree, it is Patriots Day coming up. Uh, my name's uh, Jerry Silcox, I'm a retired captain, New York City Fire Department. Uh, I was there for 32 years um, and worked all over the city. I actually ended my career in special operations about a year and a half ago when I got hurt. So uh, my wife Diane is here with me and rarely do you get to hear from wives You'll get to hear a few minutes from Diane and her heart about what happened during 9-11. So special time. I have two kids. Um, my daughter Lizzie is a doctor in Kansas. They're growing up. And my son Matt is a marine aviator in training down in Florida. Um, 
I was chapter president of Firefighters for Christ during 9-11. We started our chapter in 1998 with the permission of our great and loved president, John White, who passed away. And uh, so in my dining room, we started Firefighters for Christ in 1998. So uh, I just want to spend... Um, so it's still hard to really talk about because, you know, back in New York, we lived it. It was part of our life for eight months cleaning up that site and finding our friends. So it is, it's, it's tough to talk about. And if you'll just bear with me, um, I had cataract surgery a few days ago. So my eyes do tear. It's not me crying, by the way. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. 22 years. It, to me, it feels like yesterday. Um, for the past nights, I have been, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and just having memories and flashbacks, and it's it's been a difficult week. Just getting ready to talk to you guys about this. And, uh, you know, 40 of those guys that died that day, the 343 were my friends, my mentors, my captains, uh, fellow firefighters I went to Proby School with and stood next to in that line in Proby School. And these were guys that I loved and knew and cared about. And, um, there's a Bible verse I just want to quickly share that's in John. And it was, it was actually on the back, you know, when the New York City Fire Department, when we lose a member, a lot of times we make up a shirt and we sell it to the fire department. Now, I remember one guy had this on the back of his shirt, and it was John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than to lay down one life for his friend. And... That day on 9-11, those guys went to work like everybody else who was working, not expecting to die that day, right? We were at shift change at that point. So at nine o'clock in the morning, we changed shifts. So some guys are coming in, some guys are going home. And in the New York City Fire Department, our motto is, if you show up at 9 o'clock, you're already late. You show up at 8 o'clock in the morning. So most guys are already in at 8 o'clock in the morning. Bad for New York City Fire Department, because 8.46 a.m., what happens? You saw it on TV, right? That plane hits the Trade Center. We have almost a double shift in the firehouse at that point. So when the companies are going and getting called, what do you think the guys that are getting off are doing? Getting on the rig. It's what we do, right? Plane hit the World Trade Center. I'm working. I'm getting off. Does it matter? Didn't matter that day to me. I was at home. I was actually just getting off a of medical leave. I had broken my ankle, and uh, the day before, I was in Brooklyn at the medical office being cleared to go back to work. So I was pretty much full duty that week, and, uh, you know, I got the call from one of the members of Firefighters of Christ said, turn on the TV. And uh, I did and saw that. And I was part of the 1993 attack uh, when I was in the Bronx. So I knew what was happening. Like just, I, I knew the disaster from them and I couldn't imagine this disaster. And the buildings had not fallen at that point. So I got in my truck and went right to the firehouse. And as I was telling my brother here, I was stepping on the back step of the rig to go down there, and the chief said there was already too many guys on the rig. You can't go. So I got down there later, and uh, the buildings had fallen already. Um, that's where I was. You know, we want to remember this. So we had the shift change, 8.46 a.m., first plane hits the World Trade Center. You could see that on video. There was some French photographers following around a probie, and uh, they have video of it flying right over top of them. They were at a gas leak. 9.03, next plane hits the South Tower. 9.37, the Pentagon is hit. 
10.02, flight 93 is being taken over by the passengers. Let's roll. Ten twenty eight, the North Tower collapses. So if you think about who was in the North Tower, the South Tower was hit first. Um, eight, no, North Tower was hit. I think it was the North Tower hit. But the tower was hit, and we had a alarm go out. It was a fifth alarm assignment. So they are sending a lot of guys, a lot of trucks, and a lot of people to this incident. And when you're down in lower Manhattan, a lot of the response, believe it or not, comes from Brooklyn. So you have a lot of Manhattan companies and Brooklyn companies in these buildings. And when they fell, that was the mix, Brooklyn and Manhattan and special operations. So the first tower falls, it takes six seconds for the building to collapse. Imagine, imagine what you would be thinking about in that time. I have a friend who was a lieutenant with me. He worked with me in the Bronx. He was one of the survivors in Ladder 6. And I asked him one time, I said, Billy, what were you thinking about? What, what was going through your mind when those towers collapsed? And he goes, he said, Jerry, I, I thought we were going to get out. He said, I... I we hear the floors coming down and we're thinking we're going to get out. Somehow we're going to get out. Somehow I'm going to make it through this. He did. He survived with a few guys from Ladder 6 and a few other firemen. And, and, and he says, I, I didn't stop and say, oh, oh I'm dead. You know, he, he thought he was going to survive somehow. And he did. But that's the thought pattern is... As a fireman, we're not going into fires and giving up during the fire. You know, we're always looking, how are we going to get out of this? I, I got trapped a few times. I, I wasn't looking at, oh, I'm done, lay down on the ground. I'm looking at, how am I getting out of this? I'm on fire, I'm burning, my ears are burning. How am I getting out of this? Where's the window? That's my thought pattern. I hope some of them, some of my brother's thought pattern was, I don't have anything to do with God. I need a relationship with God, and he'll save me right here. I hope some of them were. But today I want to talk about some of them. And it's a sobering thought. It's a sobering thought that day. These guys went to work. It was the first day of school in New York, by the way. So a lot of people that had kids had switched their um, tours. We do mutuals, it's called. They switched their tours, got somebody to work for them so they could get that picture with their kid taking them to school. So a lot of guys were working, single guys were working for guys that had kids so that they could take their kids to school. So that was the setup of the day. How many of them thought, I'm gonna die today when I go to work? Anybody? No. We don't know when God is gonna call us. We don't know the last minute of our lives. Be ready to meet him is what I'm trying to say through this whole message. Just like me and Brogan, our day, the next day following to eight months, was going down there and trying to move these two buildings in five-gallon Home Depot buckets. You've probably seen the pictures of us, long line, standing in line, in our turnout pants, with our helmet, with a bucket, a Home Depot bucket most of the time, or a white bucket. But we, I really believe those first days we were gonna move that building in five gallon Home Depot buckets. That's the way New York City operates. We were gonna do it, it needed to get done. You know why? Because my friends were under that pile. I thought for a week of working down there, somebody's gotta be alive. Somebody's gotta be in here trapped. And I'm gonna talk about one of my friends in a few minutes named Patty. He was a captain with me in Harlem. This guy was a Marine recon guy in Vietnam. And he was the most decorated firefighter in New York City at the time of 9-11. He was my captain. And I, I, I tell you, 
I thought we were going to find him. I thought if anybody's alive in this building, he's alive and we're going to find him. So we're digging. This is what our days were. This is what our nights were. This is what we lived. I didn't get there for the building collapses, as I said. That step on the rig kept me from that and there. And I guess, as I say to people, God had a different plan for my life. I'm going to talk about my three friends. I'm not going to mention their last name. I think Steve's going to put a picture up for me. Charlie. We worked together for about 10 years. Charlie got promoted lieutenant out of the Bronx, and he was working in Harlem and the third division, and he was looking for a spot in one of the truck companies. And it looked real good that he was going to get this spot in a real premier truck in Harlem. And it was all good for him. And uh, Charlie was a jokester, man. Let me tell you, if you were at the kitchen table and he turned to you and it was your turn to get your you-know-what's broken, Man, it was coming and it was going to be hard and you would just turn your head and take whatever he's going to give you. But you know what that did to me? I was a Christian. I never shared the gospel with Charlie. You want to know why? I thought he was going to laugh at me. I, I did Charlie's boiler at his house. I knew his wife. I knew his kids. Um, I never shared anything with him because I was afraid of his reaction to me, telling them about Jesus Christ, right? It, it's, it's a tragedy to me. It's, it's one of those regrets I have in life was not talking to that man about my relationship. Listen, it's not up to me to save Charlie. It was not up to me. God knows his people who he is choosing on this earth and who he is bringing to heaven with his son. He knows that from the beginning of time. If Charlie was going to hear the gospel, and I hope he did, there were other guys that I worked with. <laughs> a guy named Carlos. A lot of you guys know Carlos. Carlos probably tried to share. I guarantee you Carlos probably gave him a chick track. <laughs> so I, I hope that Charlie heard the gospel. I don't know. But you know who didn't do it? Me. I didn't do it. I did not take my responsibility of sharing the gospel early in my career seriously. I did, not, I did not stand up for the Lord in my job probably for the first six years of being on the New York City Fire Department. That's just, I was afraid. I was afraid to do that. I was afraid what people will think about me. Steve, you can go to the next picture. Here's the guy. I thought we were going to find him alive. <sighs> that first night I went down there, I found his rig, and I saw the rig, and there's, if you go to the uh, World Trade, Trade Center Fire, or World Trade Center Museum, his rig is in there, and there's a door there. And I can remember stopping at his rig and going, man, you got to be alive. You got to be alive in here, Right? I'm, I, I got to find this guy. And, and you know what? Harlem knew this guy. He was captain up in Harlem for a long time before he went down to lower Manhattan. And he actually put his paper in for the truck company that was in my firehouse. And when he didn't get the truck company, somebody else got it that we had no idea how this guy ended up getting the company, but he didn't get it. He had to put his paper in to leave the battalion because he already was a captain. So that would be a slight if you stayed after doing that. And he left and went down to lower Manhattan. And Patty was, as I said, the most decorated firefighter in the New York City Fire Department at the time of 9-11. I thought I was going to find him in that pile. I, I, I was particularly searching for him and his guys. Um, you could see his jacket with all the medals. That's probably an old picture. He probably had a few more on there. Um, Patty Brown, I shouldn't say his last name. Patty um, asked me every year 
to fix his air, clean his air conditioners in his apartment in Stuyvesant Town. So I'm an air conditioning and refrigeration guy. And uh, that was my side job. So Patty, I would go to his apartment in Stuytown. We would take all the air conditioners out. I would take them to his bathtub. We would clean them and we put them back in, test them, make sure they work good. And then Patty's line to me would always be, how much can I give you, Jerry, for coming down? And I would say, nothing, Patty, take me out to dinner. And he'd go, I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so we would go out to dinner. I mean, it was great. We'd stroll the city. We'd walk over to the uh, East River. We'd chat. Um, I was on the lieutenant's list at the time. And this was June of 2001. And I remember he said to me, he said, Jerry, do me a favor. Come down on 4th of July, we'll sit on the roof of my building. The fireworks are going to be right off of my building here on the East River. Bring the family down, we'll sit up on the roof, and we'll have a night out. What do you think I said? Oh, Patty, I'm too busy. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it this year. Maybe next year. No next year. But one thing I did do right with Patty was... I knew that he needed to hear about Jesus Christ. Why? Because I knew that he was very involved in Eastern religions. And I, you know, and there was another guy in our firehouse named Mike. And Mike was on fire for Jesus. And he always wore shirts that literally long sleeve shirts that said on fire for Jesus on the sleeve. So Patty worked in our firehouse for a year and a half while they were redoing 60, uh, the, the firehouse that he worked at. And I gave him a Bible one time. I said, Patty, would you do me a favor? I said, would you, you're, he's an educated, smart man. I said, would you look through this? And I, I know you go to church, but I want you to look through this and just read about who Jesus is. And, you know, he's a gentleman. He took it. He says, I'll do that, Jerry. And I hope he did. But you can find out about him and the heroics he did that day. There are radio transmission of him just before the building fell. He's a hero. Um, after, after he died, I knew his, I, I got to meet his brother and they were cleaning out the apartment. They asked a few friends to come over and help. And I wasn't available to help, but I, I asked one of the guys to go over there. I said, do me a favor. I gave him this Bible, and I described it to him. See if you can find it. And uh, I, I never heard back. I have no idea where it was or if it was read or not. But my job as a Christian was done exactly what was supposed to be done. This man needed Jesus, and I was sharing it with him. That's what we're all called to do, every single one of you. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what's gonna to happen to your family or yourself tonight? Is your next breath guaranteed? No. You are not the God of the universe. You have no idea what your life looks like in the next 10 seconds. Be ready to meet them. I wanted my friends to be ready to meet them. The last guy I'm gonna talk about is a guy named John. You can put his picture up there, Steve. Rotation guy through 80 engine. We were uh, number one or A listed company because we were going to fires and doing a lot of work. Um, so we were in the A list. So guys that were in either B or C list would come for one year and spend it with us and go to fires and then go back to their firehouse. And <laughs> He was not in a slow company, by the way. I covered it as a lieutenant. When I got promoted, I was sent to Brooklyn, and I actually worked in his firehouse. And one of the saddest days of my life was we had these things called TPRs, time and payroll sheets, where we wrote down when people worked. And they didn't find him, my friend John. And they carried you carried those members that they didn't find on their TPR every tour that they were in, and I had to fill out his TPR. That was one of the saddest days of my life. But the good news is, is 
John worked in my firehouse. And guess who was working there? The guy with the shirt that says what? On fire for Jesus. Mike. Mike, every morning that he's working, is sitting at the kitchen table with his Bible reading. Mike's, Mike ended his career in Rescue One. Mike was an awesome fireman. Um, there was a fire where a guy ended up getting the Gordon Bennett Medal from another company in the 80s area. Mike made a better grab that night, and his captain was like, Mike, we're writing you up for a medal. He says, no, no, no. He goes, right up the company. He, so the unit got a unit citation, and this other guy went to the uh, medal day for the Gordon Bennett Medal, the highest medal. But Mike made a better grab than that guy. But that's who Mike was. A humble guy, loved the Lord. A lot of you firefighters of Christ know Mike. And you can attest that if you had met Mike more than 10 minutes, what do you think you're going to hear? You're going to hear about Jesus. About his Jesus and how he saved him out of drinking and wrecking his life. Change that man around. I'm there. John works with me. And we sit across from each other because I'm a senior guy and he's a junior guy. So he sits with his back to the, to the front and I sit in the front facing forward. It, the reason why is that I have the nozzle and he doesn't. So I need to get to the back step quicker. And that's the way it is. And that's the way it is with junior guys. So too bad. <laughs> but John sat there. I sat here. We worked in the same groups. And we argued about Christianity every single time that we worked together. Oh my goodness, we would have, we would have, we were yelling at each other in the back of the rig. And they're like, shut up. <laughs> well, we're not fighting, we're just talking. But you know, in New York, when we talk, we talk loud, right? So we're talking loud to each other. I, I, John went back to his company shortly before 9-11 and uh, I, his sister was trapped in the buildings that day. And she called him and said, I'm trapped. And he was in the engine and ladder, the ladder was going and there was a uh, female firefighter in the truck from his company and he asked to switch because his sister was trapped. He got on the truck and the whole company was lost. His sister didn't pass away. She lived. The great news about John was he was in a firehouse in Staten Island, the slow one, the C company. And there was a Christian there, just like Mike. He heard the gospel. He, that guy called me a year later and said, I just wanted to let you know that John called me in a July and gave his life to the Lord. And he passed away that day. But, you know, we know the promises of the Bible. Um, and we know that John is where he is because Jesus snatched him out of the fire of life and saved his life. The value of a soul is what? The value of a soul is really simple. God's son came down and walked on this earth for us, for me. Me, a guy that wouldn't acknowledge him before some of my friends. But he loved me so much that he would do that. That's the God I'm going to talk about. And I know where I'm going to see John again. I'm going to wrap it up now. All these men were heroes. Let me tell you. You look at video of those guys going in that building. They were going to work. Right? That's what they were doing. Everybody's running out as fast as they can in those buildings. And I'm watching the guys that I worked with. The guys that I knew. Another Christian guy, Bruce Van Hine. Um, going in that building. Going to go to work. And then they fell, and 343 firefighters from New York City died. And then we went down there and tried to find them. That's the story of 9-11 for me. Really simple. 
What does John 15, 13 say? Greater love has it that no one than, than this is to lay down one's life for a friend. I want to tell you about my hero real quick. His name is Jesus. Jesus said this next. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. My God came off of his throne 2,000 years ago, walked on this filthy earth, lived the tragedy of a human life for me. Guess what? For you. You may think that you're a good person because you're a firefighter. A lot of people, I listen, that was my line before I knew Jesus. Why are you going to heaven? Because I'm a fireman. I didn't see that in this book. It doesn't say that. You know what it says? People who acknowledge his son, God's son, as their savior, those will be saved. It says in Romans, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he will save you. It's that simple. You know why he made it simple? For people like me. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. Yeah, I did have a few lucky Saturdays and I was a captain. And uh, that's the way we usually say it. I had some lucky Saturdays. But um, he made it simple for me, for a guy like me. What's the value of our soul? It's real simple. God loved you so much. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that you, I'll put you there, or me, or my wife should not perish, but we will have everlasting life like my friend John. That's how I want to end it today. The great thing is you get to hear from my wife. Good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I just want to say thank you for the warm welcome we got this morning and to see the smiling faces serving us. Um, it just makes us feel so welcome and I thank you for that. And I also want to thank you this morning for asking me to come and share um, what, was that, what was going on in my heart as the wife of a New York City firefighter in the days after 9-11? Um, Jerry retired from the FDNY as a captain, but on 9-11 he was a firefighter in Engine 80 in Harlem, New York. Um, we turned on the television that morning, uh, that morning to see what was happening, and immediately Jerry turned to me and he says, I have to go. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean you have to go? Shouldn't you wait for your firehouse to call you and tell you to come in? And I knew it was serious. When he looked me in the eyes, he shook his head no, and he said, I have to go. So um, he left, and uh, I just, I remained glued to the TV that day. I just, I couldn't believe what was happening. Um, I think as we all did, we probably just all um, watched in disbelief and confusion and wondering why this was happening. Um, and again, I didn't know, but all I knew is that at the end of the day, the towers were gone and that there had been a tremendous loss of life. Um, as many of you may remember, in the days following 9-11, reports were coming, about, coming out about those who had died. Businesses that were located in the Twin Towers were putting together lists of those within their companies that had died. And sadly, the FDNY had to put together such a list, uh, such a list as well. I can remember the night when Jerry called me and he shared with me the names of the guys that he had known on that list. Charlie, Patty, um, John, people, he had worked on their air conditioners. I knew them, their names were familiar to me. My heart broke as I listened to the sadness and despair that was in his voice. I could also hear a sense of disbelief in his voice, disbelief that this had actually happened and disbelief that so many of his brothers, his fellow firefighters were gone. And as his wife, the wife of a fellow of a firefighter, my heart also broke because I knew that the men on those lists had wives that were now widows and children that were children that were now fatherless. I don't know how many nights later it was, but Jerry came home. And after we put the kids to bed, we both took out our Bibles to search God's word for comfort. 
I was reading through Psalms when I came across Psalm 146. And I don't have time to read the whole Psalm right now, but verse nine tells us, the Lord sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. And it was in that moment, reading those words, his word, that God quieted my heart and gave me the sense of peace that I had been yearning for since that day. And it was in that moment that he assured me that in spite of everything that was going on, he was in control. I am so grateful that God, that night, God had guided me to that psalm, that verse, that night. Another thing that I want to share with you this morning is what happened after Charles Stanley came to speak in New York City. I think it was in October. He came and he shared a message titled, Hope at Ground Zero. Jerry and I were in attendance that night. I don't remember much of what was said, but one of the things that he said that stayed with me was that he said, no one died that day outside of the will of God. For the second time, this time through the words of Charles Stanley, the assurance that God was in control enveloped my heart. And I knew that somehow, some way, I wanted to share that sense of assurance with the women whose lives had forever been changed that day. I don't remember how, but Jerry was able to obtain a list with the names and addresses of each of the women left as widows on 9-11. And through In Touch Ministries, we were able to obtain copies of Dr. Stanley's message on, for those of you, those of you who can remember, cassette tapes. And I still have it. I can't listen to it, but I still have it. I set about writing cards um, to the women, to each of the women, um, so the cards would be sent with each cassette. In each card, I had just written a little note saying that I hoped it was um, Dr. Stanley's message could bring her comfort during this time of incredible sadness. And I ended each card with the words, with all of my heart. Um, and then I signed my name. It was with all of my heart that I wanted the woman to know, to experience the comfort of God, to have the insurance that in spite of all of that, what had happened, he was in control. I was overwhelmed by cards. I, a few months in the weeks and months following, I was overwhelmed by all of the cards that I had received. Cards from widows thanking me for the tape and for thinking of them. And if I can just take a few, minute, a few minutes, I'd like to read um, some of those cards. And again, I was overwhelmed because these are women who, in their time of suffering and their sorrow, they wanted to thank me for doing something for them. And I w it was just really overwhelming. And here are some, some of the cards that I had gotten. Um, it says, Dear Diane, thank you so much for the tape. It has become part of my strength. I really need those words right now. Another one said, thank you for being so thoughtful and caring. As soon as I received the tape, I listened to it immediately. There is much comfort and hope in Charles Stanley's words. Um, another one says, thank you for Dr. Stanley's tape. We are devastated by our loss, but as Christians, we know that my husband is sitting at the Lord's feet and his work on this earth is finished. The Lord has used many Christian brothers and sisters to, sh to reach out and show me his love and support. Thank you for reaching out to me. And just the final one that I want to share says, thank you so much for your note and the Charles Stanley tape. Our faith is what is carrying us through this difficult time. God is good and God is able. And I just stand here today before you to let you know that God is good. In spite of all that happens, God is good and he is able. And I thank you so much for letting me share this morning. Good morning. Um, I'm only going to take a few minutes just to really draw this to a conclusion. Um, like me, you all probably knew where you were that moment. And I was 6,000 miles from here, or 3,000 miles from New York. And I think the whole world stopped, not just in America, the whole world stopped that day, 22 years ago. It's, it's really hard to believe that it is 22 years ago, isn't it? And we all know, I, I can't imagine there's anybody in the room who is old enough that doesn't remember what they were doing that day. And I've had the opportunity and the privilege to work with Jerry for a long time now. 
And every time I hear you, it just touches my heart so, so much. And thank you, Dan, as well. And uh, God has placed us together to do this uh, in different parts of the world. Um, but the message, the absolute message that we need to hear today is a phrase that Jerry used. And that is, what is a soul worth? What is a soul worth? You know, we all know that on that day, 22 years ago, almost 3,000 people died that day. And 343 of those were firefighter paramedics, colleagues of Jerry's, even though I didn't know any of those guys personally because we're in the firefighter family. You know how that goes around the world. We all. We all understood that. It affected us all in that moment, even though we didn't work in New York. And 343 is a number that rings in my head, and, and I'm not part of New York Fire Department, but I always remember that number. Right from the start, that number has never left me. And there's been many more has died since that time as a result of maybe injuries that they received, maybe disease that they picked up, mental health issues, Addiction, as a result of 9-11, trauma. Do you know that the New York Magazine reports that there are 422,000 people from New York who have PTSD as a result of what happened on 9-11? 422,000. Do you know what age the greatest number of people who died that day, do you know what age they were? What age bracket? Between 35 and 39. That was the greatest number in terms of age across the whole demographic of who died that day. And I just look around this room today and there are many people probably in and around that age bracket. Some older, some younger. You know, 3,000 that day and many more since as a result of it. Nobody expected to die that day. Nobody got up that morning or was coming off duty that night or whatever the case might be. No one thought they were going to die that day because we, we all know that we're going to die someday, but we never expect that it's today. And Jerry rightly said there, we don't know what the next even 10 seconds will bring us. And we know that the old will die, but we know that the young can also die. What's your soul worth? Hebrews 9, 27 says that, and just, it is, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. Do you know that your name is in God's calendar? There's an appointment. There's an appointment already in his calendar. And that appointment is the last breath that you will take. And the Bible clearly says that that will happen for each and every one of us. But after that, after that, and this is the bit that I, this, the information that I need to give you right now is that after that, the judgment, what will happen in that moment for you? Because each one of those people that day was a soul. Now you may believe that, you may not believe that, but ask the question again, what is your soul worth? What is it worth? Let me read two more verses in the words of Jesus. In Mark chapter 8, verse 36, verse 37. And we're starting to get a bit of an idea here as to what a soul is worth because Jesus says here, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So Jesus is saying that you can actually gain the whole world. And it's still not worth your soul. If I was to own everything on this planet, that says that I still can't purchase my own soul. Now, I know that we can talk about these things, and if you've been in church your lives, you'll have heard this type of thing before. We're not even trying to grapple with your emotional strings here. I'm just trying to present a fact to you that your soul, which will live on forever, you cannot purchase it. What is a soul worth? We've already said, if you own everything in this world, 
you have a nice house, you have a career, you have all those things that are actually important, family, fun, social, whatever, but nothing, nothing at all can purchase your soul. Because why? Your soul is priceless. Nothing on earth can buy it. Your soul will live on. This body, this carcass, this, this, what you see here may die. But what's inside of me will live on. But it will live on in a place of death or it will live on in a place of life. Forever. What worth is your soul? There's only one thing. Jerry's already covered. There's only one thing that can redeem your soul. Only one thing. And that is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That was shed on the cross 2,000 years ago for you and I. And as Jesus hung there and he suffered, and he suffered. He suffered physically. He suffered terribly physically. He suffered spiritually. He suffered so much. And yet whenever he was being held to that tree... He was doing that to redeem your soul. That's what value your soul is. And that Jesus Christ died for it. And it's already been said, for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son for you so that you could have everlasting life and that would not perish in a place called hell. And Jerry said it. All you have to do is believe what I've just said. You know, sometimes we complicate it. Sometimes we put stuff in place that we really shouldn't put in place because it's as simple as what I've just said. There is no simpler message than the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All you have to do is lose your life for him. And that will save your life. It sort of doesn't make sense, but yet it's simple. Lose my life for Jesus. Lose my life to Jesus. And I will save my life for eternity. Because you and I, as I've already said, we will live eternity somewhere. And people sort of get caught up in that word death. But I'm telling you, whenever the Bible talks about an eternal death, it is an eternal existence. It's not just a moment in time where somehow we we get destroyed in hell. No, it's an eternal existence in death. Can you imagine what that's like? And yes, we may get 60, 70, 80 years here on earth, maybe more if God spurs us, maybe only 35 or 39 years for all those people that day. But we're going to spend eternity somewhere. And I know where, I, I know where I'm spending eternity. I'm going to spend eternity with the Lord because I'm going to spend eternity in life. And it is so, so easy For me to say to you today, do you want to spend eternity in life? Or do you want to spend eternity in death? Because that's the choice. That's the choice in this moment in time, right now. You can never say that you haven't been told. Because I'm telling you now. Jerry told you, Diane told you. You know, the Bible says that that's all of us, by the way. Romans 3.23 says that for all have sinned. All, all of us. None of us are perfect, by the way. All of us have sinned and we all fall short. We all fall short of the glory of God because we can never, ever, ever do something so that we can somehow be good enough. And Jerry made an interesting comical statement this morning that he thought he was going to heaven because he was a fireman. But you know what? Actually, it might sound comical to us, but it's a reality. And I spoke to many people around this world, and I have, and I've had the privilege of traveling, and it's, I would suggest that every person I've ever spoke to, certainly that everybody that I can remember, thinks that they're good enough, thinks that they're good enough for heaven. But, the, but you're not. None of us, and that's not me pointing the finger at you guys, because guess what? I wasn't good enough either. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned. We've all been born into that place, and none of us make the mark. We all fall short. 
And Romans 6.23 says that for the wages of that sin then, so that sin, if that is the condition of my heart, the condition of my life, it says that for the wages of that, what I will get in, uh, as a result of that, it says is death. That existence and death that I was talking about. But the free gift, the purchase, the redeeming Christ will actually give me that eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And Romans, Romans all the, way, all the way here because Romans says that for God shows his love for us and that whilst we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's a really, really, really simple message. And it's already been quoted this morning that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that right here in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved that's what it says isn't that fantastic Jerry also quoted Jude verse 23 that we will snatch others from the fire and save them that's what's happening here this morning because there's a metaphoric fire burning in this room this morning. And that is the fire that if you don't redeem, if you do not accept Jesus as your own personal saviour, you will perish in hell, which is a place of fire. And as firefighters, I can imagine you understand that probably more than some. And we get the privilege and the opportunity over all of our careers to snatch people from that fire. Well, what if I was to say to you right now, that as a spiritual firefighter, I have the opportunity to present Jesus Christ to you right now so that you can be snatched from that fire of hell. And so it's simple. I'm just going to give you that opportunity this morning. Please do not miss this opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your own and personal Savior. You don't have to go home and sort out all your stuff first. I've had opportunities to present Christ to people over the years. I've sat with people in the middle of the night as they cried their eyes out, roughy, tufty firefighters crying their eyes out because they want to give their life to Jesus, but feel that they can't because they're not yet good enough. See, if you're waiting to be good enough, you'll never be good enough because none of us are good enough because it was Jesus who paid the price on the cross for you and I. You will never be good enough. So when we give our life to Jesus Christ, that's the beauty of it. He accepts us for whoever we are, no matter what it is that we've done. He covers our sin with his blood. We are worthy of heaven. We are going to heaven. We are saved for eternity. And then we get some of the stuff sorted. Yeah? That's the process. It's really simple. I... I Sometimes it's complicated, but it shouldn't be. That's it. It's simple. So if you're here this morning, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to Jesus. And we're not going to make anything really complicated at all. I want you just to let me see your hand so that I know that that's the decision that you're making this morning. And then I'm going to pray. And you're going to pray that with me and the angels in heaven are going to go, yeah. Because that's what the Bible tells us. <laughs> it's, this book's amazing. You should open it sometimes. There's really, really interesting stuff in it. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. So I'm going to look around the room. I'm looking at this section here. Does anybody here want to give their life to Jesus Christ? Or you maybe once did that and you're cold and you're far from Christ now. Do you want to recommit your life to Christ or to give your life to Christ for the first time? In this section here, you can see where I'm looking. Anybody here? Anybody here want to give their life to Jesus Christ? I don't see anybody there. In the middle section, I'm looking at the middle section. Anybody want to give their life to Jesus Christ for the first time? Or to rededicate, recommit your life to Jesus? Anybody in this section? I'll come back, don't worry. Anybody in this section over here on my right, your left? Come on. Do you know in the fire service we have such a thing as a secondary search? just in case we miss you the first time. <laughs> it's true. Isn't that right? So I'm going to go again, right? Okay. 
Are we starting to say it again? Anybody over here? Not know Jesus. We're not. This isn't an auction. <laughs> this is just giving you the opportunity to respond to Jesus. It's really easy. Anybody? Come on. Just show me your hand. He publicly died for us on the cross, you know. That's why I'm not even asking you to put your heads down. Anybody there? No. Anybody in the center again? I'm looking from the front. Anybody want to give their life to Jesus? I don't see anybody. Anybody again on my right, your left? No. I know this is going out online, I believe. Is that right? If people are watching this online, you can respond. No doubt there's contact details there for the church. Please, I'm going to tell you how to pray. Even in the room this morning, if you felt that you wanted to, but you didn't, you can pray. And tell us, please tell us afterwards, tell us that that's what you did. So that we can rejoice with you. Yeah? Don't leave this building today without getting your soul right. Because you can't purchase it yourself. But I'm going to pray anyway, because I know people are watching online. I'm going to pray just in case there's people within this room this morning who just couldn't feel that they could raise their hand for me. And just as I pray, you can pray along these simple words with me, either online or here in the church. And if that's online, you contact the church. There'll be details on there. You contact the church and someone will talk to you. Okay, Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that you died for me. I know that you rose again from the dead. I believe it in my heart. Lord, forgive me for my sins. And I thank you that I'm now saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Please, please, please contact us here at the church. If you're watching online or if you're within the building, please talk to us before you go home today. God bless you. It's been such a privilege being over here with you again. In Jesus' name, amen.